First of all, any of you understands English? Has any problem with English? No, the back of everybody is hungry. <laughs> That's the problem when, when you have uh, this house starting in the end of So, well, I'm joking. Thank you everybody for coming. Everybody listen to me. Yeah? Yeah. At the end of the room. Okay. Fine. Um, first of all, I would like to thank you for coming. Thank you, Colin, for coming to, to Barcelona. He was uh, traveling a lot and then we come from London, I think. And thank you to Alex. I will present you guys uh, later on. He still runs the Barcelona Cassandra user group. So I thank you for coming here. So thank you. Thank you all of you. And, um, I'm, I'm usually start this presentation asking for, for what's the Java user group and I will ask you some who were some of you are, are new from to the Barcelona Java user group who didn't know that Barcelona Java user group exists before. So who's the first time that it comes to the Barcelona Java user group? One, two, three, four, okay. There's a lot of people that doesn't so sorry guys, the, the, the people that already know uh, that Barcelona Java group And 
uh, we're trying to bring in good speakers from London to here. So it's a good point, I think. So if you have an idea, you know, some, some guy that is in London, uh, come on, tell us because I think we can bring it to here. Another kind of uh, new knowledge uh, and thing is a good one. If you think about how many possibilities there are in Europe, you will know that London is a, is a huge market. And then we have an agreement with a, uh, with a company called Records. And they have a lot of positions of vacancies open to looking for a Java good developers. And these guys are telling that they are looking for a, for a good uh, Java engineer. So if you think that you are trying to move to London, come with that because they will help you. We will help you to find some kind of uh, accommodation and... Okay. And uh, that's it. I mean, so I'm going to have the next, the next event. I think it's interesting for all of you who know something about Java 8. I know something about Java 8. Okay, and, and this guy, Steve Machine, is uh, one of the most important guys that plays with and works with Java. He's a Java Technology Ambassador from Oracle. And he will come the next, uh, I think it's the next one, the other one. And he will come and play and talk about Java 8 and Lattes and uh, he will explain about what, right, which are the benefits of Java 8 and he will bring a kind of uh, Legos and uh, we'll control the Legos with the Java 8 uh, platform so it will be really amazing so grab this page because it will be, will be a really interesting even I think and we have a lot of different uh, technologies uh, behind so if you think one of them would be interesting please talk with us Share. Okay, I prefer this one and the other one. We're talking about coherence or release or trap. So there are a lot of new technologies. Okay, so please share your opinion. And that's it. I mean, I'm only saying hello to the people that it's the next, it's the first day that came from coming. So thank you for coming. Uh, join us, please, and share your opinion, share your point of view. We would like to, to help you somehow and try to grow the community and bring to you a biggest event and more interesting event for you. So that's from my part. I would like to thank you again to Colin for coming and to Alex, who is the organizer of the uh, Cassandra user group, to organize this kind of event. I know there's a, a, a few commitments we could try to bring it quickly, but uh, I think it's really fun because we have about 50 people here, so not too bad. And uh, that's my problem. So, if I don't want to present my job. So, uh, everybody, I'm Alex. For those who cannot see me before, some of the co organizers of the Sandra Personal Group. Um, I'd like to thank uh, all of you for coming here this evening. Thank Colin uh, for coming to visit us here and give a very presentation on the
six weeks. And in that six weeks, I think I've put 40,000 air miles in my, my group of player program. Uh, I'm happy to be here and to take it easy. The, uh, the, I judge folks all on two criteria. Um, I'm kind of a big guy, if you didn't notice. And so the bed and the tub are really important to me. <laughs> so, um, but my background, I've been uh, using Cassandra since point six. So that goes back to maybe 2008 or, or 2009. Um, and I'm gonna, my approach to these talks is a little different than maybe what you've been exposed to. I come from a, a very proprietary world of software. Uh, for 20 plus years I've been building large distributed systems. You know them as stock exchanges. So I've worked on the Paris Stock Exchange, the London Stock Exchange, New York Stock Exchange, Boston Stock Exchange, National Stock Exchange, <laughs> um, and, and other companies like E-Trade, Fidelity, and etc. Um, and most recently I was at NYSE Euronex, which is the New York Stock Exchange. Euronex, we run about 28 exchanges globally. I think there's one here, if not here, it's in Madrid, I'm pretty sure. And so what I'm going to talk about is a big system that we built called Darkstar, which is on the planet Cassandra. I'm going to talk a little bit about why we chose Cassandra, um, some of the issues that we had coming from the world of proprietary software. Uh, we, didn't, we didn't share and we didn't use open source. <coughs> that you can make in using Cassandra, and I'll, and I'll share with you some of those so that you don't make them yourselves. Because we can save you some pain. But first I've got some big news. And I built a lot of these systems 
using things like Oracle, Microsoft SQL Server, etc. But and we can talk about that. I usually use a whiteboard that I draw pictures with it when I do this. But I, let me back up a little bit. How many people have used Cassandra? Thank you. Have a t shirt. <laughs> <laughs> if you say nine things, then I give you a t shirt. So, so no one has used Cassandra. Does, I, does everybody know what Cassandra is? Okay. Um, so there were. I'm going to go back to the second. I'm just going to go did anybody hear a dark star on the planet of Cassandra? Okay, one guy, thank you. Um, so there are a couple of things that, that attracted me to Cassandra, and we're going to go through that, um, because it, it, was, it could offer me 100% uptime, and it could offer me replication out of the box. And how many people have done master-slave replication, right? Okay, you're replicating between two different sites with queuing either built themselves or, or use MSMQ or Rack or Teradata to tease a, stuff like that. Yeah. <coughs> but what kind of data were we restoring? Um, is anybody, am I going to say anything tonight that anybody's heard of? Fixed messages. <laughs> Fix is a, a language that's used for electronic trading. This uh, financial information exchange. And what it is, is it's, it's, it's almost, it looks kind of like a JSON. Uh, object is a tag data from other logic, and so this is a pie of 100 of uh, CBS uh, for the day in the market. 35 equals D is the order type. Buy 100 shares of CBS, right? But the problem is that fix isn't a standard; it's a suggestion. Fix is a standard at the at the, the network level for establishing a connection between two machines. That has to be pretty much spot on. But the content of these messages is different for each, each potential participant in the financial world. Right? They might have additional tags so that they can relate information right, back to something internally that they don't want to share with us. And so now I have the requirement of always a replication and dynamic schema. I built column stores before, tag data, uh, you know, key value stores in Oracle and other databases before, but that wasn't going to work that with the volume that we had because we also wanted to be multi-tenant. So what about the, the market? We need to compare, this is why I said earlier, that even if you're doing this for one person or one company, we would need to look at all the orders for all the markets. And that's about 40 or 50 execution venues in the United States uh, for about a half a million messages per second sustained throughout the day first into several million messages per second. That's just the market data. So that's what's going on in the market. So, so that, that's the data that we can work with that number. Those are more narrow messages, high velocity. The fixed order flow though is that you usually have about eight of these before you get one of those. And they're wider messages. And so this whole throughput of the system, we had to do over a million per second. We had to do three standard deviation on top of that to handle a market event. We had to have 100% uptime. We had to have replication. And we had to have dynamic schema to keep track of different message formats. Let's talk about Darkstar a little bit. Cassandra was the, what we went with for the persistence layer. Darkstar was the event processing engine. Does anybody have any experience with screen processing? Esper, BusinessWorks. Okay, so we have, we'll get a little bit into that. Event processing language, what we did in Darkstar is we had four things. We had an event processing language, or think of that as a domain specific language, and we'll get, give some examples. We had continuous cursor, so when I select from a stream, I would get a continuous result setback when the conditions that I was asking for were satisfied. And I'll give some examples of that. Time length windows, so I want the average stock price grouped by symbol over the last 30 minutes, and I want you to 
tell me what that is every minute. Okay? And then I want to do pattern matching across windows. When somebody trades on this side of the market and then trades on this side of the market and does that a number of times, I want someone to call him up and ask him what he's doing because he might be breaking the law. So here are some examples of uh, the event processing language that we use in Darkstar. So like, uh, select star from an event where temp is greater than 100. So this is a SQL-like language. That looks like SQL to me. The only difference here is that it runs continuously. Right? And so if I send that in from a Java program, every time a new event occurs on the, the, uh, the it should be temperatures for thermostat. Right? So like every time I get a new event, and the temperature in that event is over 100 degrees, my program is going to get notified. It's a push versus a pull. So let's talk about adding windows to that. Let's say I want the average temperature from a thermostat over the last 30 minutes. I don't want that every time the temperature is measured. I want you to give it to me once, once a minute, but I want the average over the last 30 minutes. Okay? So I can do things with this like, did my average stock price just jump a bunch in one minute versus 30 minutes? Is somebody doing something in there? Right, I can look at the slope of change. I can compare that to a Twitter feed. Maybe somebody's talking about that stock. I can relate those two. We listen to everything, by the way. We listen to a lot more information than, than you think the stock has changed. My NSA would be pretty bad for a number of years. <laughs> <laughs> They're still catching up. Uh, here's, here's a really neat, this is where things start getting really interesting. So here I want to declare an event or a pattern. So every time in a, in a stock tip event, the, the symbol is IBM and the price goes over 80, in 60 seconds from when I submit this query, this is a query, and I want you to tell me. Okay? Or, here's kind of a neat example, find events that occur all by themselves over the last 10 minutes that don't repeat, don't repeat themselves within the 10 minutes. So this could be a heartbeat, right? Tell me when my heartbeats go down between the different systems. So all we're doing to go back to SQL is we're adding a continuous cursor, time and length windows, and pattern matching across those windows, right? So if it happened in the first 10 minutes followed by something in the second 10 minutes, then tell me about it. Well, what happens when you mix the peanut butter of Cassandra with the chocolate of Darkstar? You get streaming map reduce in real time. Right, this is Darkstar. So these, these queries would go out onto the nodes of a, a Cassandra cluster running with Darkstar on each node. Darkstar would intercept the query, act as a coordinator, just like Cassandra does when you send the cluster a query, perform some manipulation, send it out to the rest of the nodes in the cluster, and then listen for the results and send it back. So this and then is processing all the inbound data and all the derived data, derived data, all the aggregated data, all the completed data. One of the things that we're doing, and maybe this, this starts to paint a picture, we're listening to a million events per second. We're only interested in the things we're interested in. Right? And we might have hundreds or thousands of clients connected to the system. I can't send each one of those clients a million events per second. So I've got to find a way to filter, aggregate, aggregate them down into meaningful buckets, complain them, complain them for broadcasts, and just send out things that they're interested in. And so Cassandra helped with that as well as the dark star. So this is how it ran. Uh, this is a node cluster, dark star. So did the dark star VM virtual machine with Cassandra. We had a number of fixed feeds and then market data uh, feeding the system. And then we had a client, several different types of clients, API, local clients for operations. The system was maintained and ran out of three countries, New York, Belfast, and Ireland, and Manila. This was a 
24 7 system. Okay. I got a lot of t shirts, I'm waiting for questions. <laughs>
there, there's things that Cassandra does that none of the other SQL databases do, or NoSQL databases do with the white label. Use defaults. Um, I've worked with a lot of people that have Cassandra clusters, and before the application is done, or before the data modeling is done, they want to mess with configurations. Right? Wait until you're done, use the defaults, and then there are tools within Cassandra, no tool tells me what's going on within the cluster, tells me what's going on with the node. TP stats tells me, am, am I handling the load that's on a node? Okay. Uh, CF histogram tells me for a table within a key space within Cassandra what my read write vacancies are, right, so I can model that. Compaction stats tells me if compaction is occurring. Does everybody know that Cassandra is a log? We only append information, even if when we're changing, when we're doing updates. And so in the background, what Cassandra is doing is compacting the information that we've written, excuse me, the changes that we've made to it into, into smaller files, or the next one, I'm sorry. Consolidating it, that's called compaction. Well, that takes away from the node's ability to service feeds and service rates. Test under load, any distributed system. Kill nodes while you're testing. Simulate your, your writing. Simulate your reading. Trigger compaction. Right? If, you, if you're using Cassandra because of the replication, because of the uptime, because of the dynamic schema, then size the cluster so that if, if a node goes down at 2 o'clock in the morning, you schedule a replacement. You don't have to get up at 2.30 and go and replace it. You can do it in your schedule. Right. So size, it, size your clusters so that you have done these things to them. Break it, break it again, and practice fixing it so that you don't have to fix it for the first time in production. I've done that. Less <laughs> <laughs> than a fun weekend. <coughs> Two and one parameter at a time. You know, I guess, who loves JVM tuning? Besides you. <laughs> right? I mean, it, it's, it's monotonous, it's mind-bending, it's hours of fun, okay? Same thing, right? So once, once you get your application size, right, once you, once you tested it under various scenarios, um, you know, now start taking a look at the parameters, right? So you run the tools to, to look at your Cassandra cluster, you see that we have some blocking flush writers. Right, just as an example, well here I might I might increase the flush writers. I've got some far new GC occurring, right? So maybe my heap is too big, and maybe my new heap size is too big. Right? But we test one change, one at a time, run the tests, right, keep track of it. Um, don't don't go in and change a whole bunch of things at the same time. Because you've got so much going on, you've got the compaction thing going on in the background. That's not normal in a database. Right? So you want to make sure that you're just testing one thing at a time, as, as mind dumbing as that can be. Right? Run your benchmarks and compare. Use enough resources, again, the law of physics. You know, if we're replicating data in a cluster so that it's available, um, and we get a lot of ingestion and people reading random data, make sure you have some memory. Any application is just a cache. That's the way I think of applications. The, 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 the first row of the cache is the memory that I'm interacting with. The second level of the cache is the, the memory that the, the, the program can access. Uh, I might have some, some specific caches that I'm maintaining. There's the OS page cache, right? So I only want an eight gig key per node for Cassandra, but Linux, like Ubuntu, is really smart about using memory for OS page cache. Okay, so don't cheat your Memory is cheap. Cores, um, eight is a good number. Uh, the second thing, second worst thing you can do after porting your data model from Oracle is run it on a SAN. Okay? Because then what you're doing is you're taking a distributed cluster based system and aggregating all the IO down to one box. Right? You, want the, you want to use local disks and you want separate read write paths for log and for data. Okay. If you're interested in learning more about Darkstar, it's on Planet Cassandra. And then I write a blog that's even drier and less funny than this has been. Oh, God. <laughs> I'm supposed to laugh at that one. <laughs> <laughs>
Uh, and you, so I talked about this number of things, talked about solar, um, and how to reduce, and stuff like that out there. Any questions? This is it. I'd like, I'd like to just use the slides to, to really kick off conversations and, and be more interactive. <laughs>
Did that answer your question? <laughs> large, extra large. <laughs>
The biggest problem I have with HPA is the CPU. <coughs> in a distributed system, and that goes back to the, the Mongo. I don't like master slave architectures. I don't like split brain. I don't like voting. Firestar ran at full speed with redundant compute with no voting. And, and to do, so we had to have two answers to, to every everything that was posed to Firestar. We had to provide two answers. Right? So we ran the HA within our clusters. To do that with voting and master slave, it's um, the, the cluster peer-to-peer, -peer, the, the nodes, nothing is shared, it's shared nothing. And so where does that come from? You can thank music downloading. Right? Napster. That's the, the type of architecture. Um, if we had to share a state between the nodes, we would, we'd lose scale fairly quickly. Hey, I'm working in a monitoring system where I do a lot of
have this paper about uh, how to make backup policies for uh, logical recoveries. If you have, if you delete some data, it's duplicated with all of the nodes. Then, mm -hmm. if you want to recover, how do you make it? Well, you can do, you can set up, you can snapshot for point in time recovery, right? And you can set up snapshots so that they happen at regular intervals. Or you can, and then you can also trigger snapshots and truncate. The snap and the snapshots are nice, they create hard links that you can just save off to another, you know, sand, um, NAS, whatever, whatever it is that you, you're using for that. But yeah, we have that. So you, you grab the logs, Cassandra has that, you grab the logs and the, uh, the snapshots for a point time recovery. The updates yeah. in, in terms of like the whole our new version of the new release. Oh, how how do you this work for adults? Oh, that's um, just on the the uh, Cassandra the Apache that works. Um, about three major releases a year and and three point releases. It's a it's an incredibly active community. Um, it's, it moves fast. Every 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 uh, release seems to see something really. So like the, we have now lightweight transactions, so that's an implementation of Paxos. Um, so I can say uh, update table set column equal column if, if column equals 100. And that's, that's an impressive accomplishment for those of you who know Paxos. So we're using it for distributed row walking. How did you distribute the work on the dark side? I'm sorry? How did you distribute the work on the dark side when you did the records? We had to, so that's, that's a really good question. Actually, that's, that's a really good question. So, um, we had to use, we had to shard, right? And the reason we had to shard is because when you're doing pattern, pattern stuff across time windows, you want the dimensions to be local to that node.
<coughs> tells me that I can have any two or three properties. I can have consistency, availability, um, with or without a partition, or when, when a partition happens, or, or any, any of those two can be made up. But the you know, communications links go down, and one of the biggest problems uh, using a queuing, uh, a queuing system like MSMQ between primary and, and warm, or primary and, and uh, hot backup, is what I call going past the point of no return in a, in a system like this. And so <coughs> if, we, if we couldn't process and we got too far behind versus what we knew we had to do for the rest of the day, that was a shutdown event. And so, how do you scale queuing in replication? No, like with MSMQ, like a Microsoft SQL Server, right? So, and then how could I just switch over to, how could I have the, the have dynamic replication in that scenario? Right? That's a split brain issue. And so, there were, this was not a decision that we made lightly because we had access to just about every database.
massive uh, data or massive uh, connections. So the, um, again, I, I tend to think of Cassandra as a distributed toolkit with, with the persistence and the reputation um, as, as features. And so let me give you an example uh, of somebody. Uh, let's say that you're running, uh, you've got a web service. Um, and depending on the browser that you're using or the, the virtual machine or where it's hosted, um, you, you think you have a sticky session, but you don't. Right? And so what do we do today? We try to move all the state out of the out of the app, right? So that we can, you know, mid mid session, we don't care where the client is coming in. Well, that's not possible with all applications all the time. Um, and sometimes it's just easier to cheat. And so um, maybe using Cassandra like a, a small cluster in each data center and using that to replicate session information so that when a, a client bounces, right, that the, that information is there. That's one use case that's not not a big big cluster. Um, you know, small number, small number of nodes on either side. I was thinking of you know we see the small solar in an internal solar for a small company. Sure. That the program they are using uh, a scale server. Sure. Or I don't think, think relational databases are going anywhere. Okay. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's not <laughs> yeah. No, I've i I've, I've been in technology long enough. I'm not I'm not religious um, about what I use. I use the tool that works. Um, if another database does what you need it to do to get done what you need to do, and it's a, you don't want to me, take another risk point in your development, then use that database. And if you get to the point where you need scale, um, always on the replication, you know, then you take a look. The argument that you would make then is, well, if I am going to take the risk or if there's some knowledge, why wouldn't I go with that solution in the first place? Right? But it's, to, to me, Building systems is about mitigating risk and not accumulating debt. You know, I mean, it's, I don't mind the systems that I built are not systems that can go down. But to me, the secondary after that is just the, the, how much debt have I, how much debt have I accumulated? Do I got to pay the house? Related to this question, what do you think about, for example, if you have uh, your team, you know, that knows about related databases and you have your, uh, your system, your UIT system? How, how the people can be, you know, changing his mind and approach to how Cassandra works. Sure. It's, it's really difficult for a company to, you know, move in this approach. But the, well, now I can read, you know, what we did internally and then what I've seen other, other companies do is, you know, don't pick a boil the ocean project. You know, pick something that's small. <coughs> don't, don't make up something, you know, just to use Cassandra. But you know, pick something that, that you need the replication, you need the always on, you need the dynamic schema, and use it in a small way, and learn, um, and beat the crap out of it. You know, so that you, you really understand the characteristics of it before you go any anymore, so you mitigate the risk. Would be my, you know, so small pilot. You know, it's it's pretty easy to download. You know, yeah, but you have to change your mind because it's not the same as a relation of the so are you saying this is to think in terms of the white rows and the data model for me? That was for example, what about with the IT, you know, with the IT guy that makes a backup and uh, I think that this guy is going to be change his, his mind because the, the backup I suppose is really difficult to, to achieve. No, I mean, uh, no, no, not at all. But it's it's going to it's different. And anything different takes time. And, uh, I think the longer you've been doing this, it takes more time to forget what you forget what you know. That makes it difficult to learn new stuff. In reality, um, running a Cassandra cluster is easier than running a master slave with replication between data centers. Right? But it's just different. You know, so it, it takes a learning curve. At least for me, it was. You know, now looking back, you know, it's like, well, it's so hard to understand. Do you use Cassandra query language or I started with Thrift, everything I did was with Thrift. Um, I recently had to learn Cassandra query language and I was very skeptical. I didn't think it would do the things I wanted to do. Um, but it does. I still 
still have my access to, so I can do things with dynamic schema in the same way that I did with Swift. It's a little different, but it accomplishes the same result. Um, so I was, uh, I'm new to it. It's okay. I like it. It does what I need it to do. The next question. Does somebody who's new to the uh, MySQL database, um, looking at the latest version of CQL, it looked to me like it was pretending to emulate a uh, relational database and using, it looked like it was using secondary indexes or other things. Would you advise a newcomer to try and work under the covers and try and understand what really is happening behind that? Or no. how, how should you approach this? No, I would start with SQL. You know, what it's, you say, you know, emulating a relational database. And so, you know, I, I can see that, but the, there's something else that's really, that's what is really happening. And that is we're returning a row on a wide row, right? What you're doing is getting a row, right? So we're taking a, a wide row on the database, which is really multiple tiny rows. And so when you do a select, you know, start from where the partition key is equal to this, and the cluster, cluster keys are greater than equal or less than or equal, et cetera, what it's doing is it's taking that wide row and just getting it back to under the wide row basis. Um, it might do, I, I think every once in a while it shows use of secondary indices. I, I try not to use them myself. Um, you know, there are, there are other ways to model. Um, and the question is, is it, a, is it um, an ease of use, right? And, or is there something that is making you think, don't do this, right? So in any NoSQL database, in the, 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 you know, especially you know, the stuff we're talking about right now, that we try to make it look like a reported, people try to make it look like a, a relational database. You know, duplicating data, you know, we, we, we're told not to do that, right? Um, we're told not to do a lot of secondary indexes in relational world. But what's the one thing that, that all the, when people look at NoSQL world from relational world, the, the one thing that they always tell us say is, well, for speed, we always do materialized use. So that's what you're doing in NoSQL world, is you're building materialized views to support a query. And so if you're doing that, um, and you, let's say you go to the, the, you know, the extreme viewpoint of that, what do you need a secondary index for? Okay. No need. So I think, I think maybe, you know, depending on your point of view, it's a valid criticism, but um, I think that those uh, predispositions kind of start to fall away once you once you get started and once you start to think about the data model in a way that it's not even happen. Thank <laughs> you. 